I'm used to you booping me in. No, oh, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to start reading it. <laughs> Welcome to episode 50 of the Civil War Breakfast Club. Tonight, I am joined by my host who has put up with my Tuesday moods for the last 50 episodes and the guy who rocks all things Civil War more than anybody else I know, Darren Weeks. Wow. Deja vu. <laughs> But um, no, it's going to have 50 episodes. Holy crap. How the, yeah. how the hell have we made it this far? It's, it's I don't actually, know why you put up with me, but I'm not sure are. how we made it this how these last 50 minutes, a little 50 episodes, but it's not a story. Must be the DQ guess, oh, discounts yeah, I'm giving you. Must be something. Must be, be something. something. something so, right. how, no, definitely. so how are you? What's going on? What's new? Not too much. We were at episode 50, which um, we were obviously taking it back to the Western Theater tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's hot. It's sticky. It's steamy. It's a very Western theater Atlanta type of day. So and believe this, me, um, when it when it's hot and hot like that, and it rains, Darren gets really grumpy. Darren, oh yeah, it's like oh. Mary on a Tuesday. Oh, definitely. No, no question about that. It's raining it's again. It's rained every day. It's been really, really it's hot. Raining so again. That's okay. It's gray. Well, it's gloomy. It's definitely. It's, oh, yeah, it's gray. It's always gray every day. <laughs> it's gonna be cold. It's gonna be gloomy. It's gonna last for the rest of your life. The glass is always half empty. Oh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, what's new with you? I, I know once again, we have to ask a very important question. What am I drinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am drinking. We're, we're waiting. <laughs> I am drinking Hazy Twilight. Um, see if I can get that. I can't get it on the camera. Never mind. I'm drinking Hazy Twilight from Bayfield Brewing Company, which is their new New England IPA which um, I chose that because obviously we're going to be talking about Oliver Otis Howard tonight, and he's uh, probably one of my favorite New Englanders. So I thought, have a New England IPA for that. And I'm drinking it out of my mug that has Sherman's staff on it. And it's impossible to show that with a background. Um, anybody watching this on YouTube will notice that the background that I'm using is Sherman staff. That's what's on the mug that I'm using. Must be the biggest mug ever you have. It is. Anyway. I, <laughs> what are you drinking? I'm drinking Castle Island from here in uh, New England here. I'm drinking it because it has a cannon on it, which is very cool. Nice. And I just spilled half of it. Mm. And I'm drinking it out of my North Civil War Champions mug because despite the stories of the general we will talk about later on today, this is a one that the North wins and one that he wins handily mm -hmm. uh, as far as a lot of different ways. So um, I felt that it was appropriate to uh, to talk about uh, a northern victory tonight since this basically was to it's debated right by yeah. certain people but we consider a northern victory i think I, overall i think we can call it a northern victory it is definitely a battle that does not the battle of ezra church which is what we're going to be talking about tonight is part of the atlanta campaign um so sherman's been on this campaign since may of 1864 um some of the bigger battles in the ca campaign we've done episodes on kennesaw mountain being one of them um and this is one that does not get talked about a lot, but it's one that I think is a very underrated battle for a number of reasons, not just for the battle itself, but for the commanders here. Um, not just Oliver Otis Howard, but Stephen D. Lee on the Confederate side as well. John Bell Hood um, has been newly put in place of Army of Tennessee is commanding that. Um, as well as like, you know, Black Jack Logan's in this as well, and, and he does pretty well, but it's as much about the battle as it is about who's commanding and kind of the aftermath is, is just as interesting as the battle itself. Um, but the battle is very, very horrific as we're going to talk about the aftermath of that. In some ways, it is a lot like Franklin and that yeah. never gets mentioned. And it's, it's that's important to consider when you're looking at Hood as the commander of Army of Tennessee, because this battle is, and we'll talk about this at the end, this battle is why the soldiers start to feel about him the way that they do. Yeah, we, we were talking about earlier parts of this Atlantic campaign, specifically on Kennesaw, we talked about what Sherman likes, right? Sherman loves to be attacked. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to be the attacker. He likes to fight defensively. Um, not that so much he didn't like to fight offensively because he did what he had to do, but he, primarily he loved playing defense. And he has that quote where he says, invite them to attack, they'll only beat their own brains out. So yeah. what he wants to do is ideally set, a, set up a situation where he's attacked. 
And of all the battles of this campaign, this is the one he gets what he wants. This is one that it's the, he leads the, you know, the mouse right to the cat is what he really does. And it's really by happenstance. It isn't by design. It just, mm-hmm. we'll talk about how the detail goes, but Sherman knew by Atlanta, he had more men and he knew that if he was attacked because he, had, he was entrenched, there was really no chance he was going to lose because he had too many guys. He knew that any attack against his entrenched army at this point was, was going to be a fool's errand because he just didn't, they just didn't, didn't have the numbers, you know, but what's interesting going into this though, is the changes both armies had going into this part of this campaign. So, um, and right off the top was the death of James McPherson, which is a, which is a big deal. Yeah. On July the 22nd, 1864, the battle of Atlanta happens, which you see hood go behind that kind of forces hood into Atlanta, but what happens is McPherson ends up getting killed. Um, James Burbsey McPherson, very well respected on both sides of the Civil War. His death is like greatly affects Sherman. It also greatly affects John Bell Hood too. Um, Sherman wrote to Halleck after and said, the sudden loss of McPherson was a heavy blow to me. I can hardly replace him, but he must have, have a successor. His immediate successor, the one that takes over for him when he's killed, is John Blackjack Logan, a political general from Illinois. He is actually, he goes into the war a Democrat, but after the war, he's he's a Republican. Uh, just one thing to mention about McPherson too is, and this is debated, he is the second highest ranking officer that will be killed in the Civil War. And that was a big one too. And as you mentioned, it affected both armies, North and South. He was a very beloved guy and a very respected guy. Replacing him was not going to be easy for Sherman. He knew it. Um, we, there were three guys primarily he had to choose from. Okay, We'll talk about them real quick. We'll tell them more detail here in a second. First guy, is, to your point, is John Blackjack Logan. Hmm. He was a politician from Illinois, and we all know how much Sherman hated politicians. Yep. He was also not West Point trained, and that was going to be a big deal. So although he was popular with his troops, and he certainly was, and he expected the gig, and he wanted the gig. Oh, big um, time. It, it was that fact that he was a politician and he didn't have West Point was going to be an issue for Sherman. And he's a um, little bit yep. of a loose cannon, too, in some ways. Yeah, he was. Door number two is fighting Joe Hooker, a mm-hmm. good Massachusetts man. And he did well as a corps commander under Sherman in, a, in the Atlantic campaign. Admittedly, he had those troubles at Chancellorsville. Everybody knows about that in 1863. Yeah. And he was a West Pointer. But he was also that quasi-political general. And he was kind of that slippery shit of a guy where he just yeah. was the, he, you know, he, he just was a guy, he's a guy you called to get free cable for five bucks. He would hook up, you know, that, that's who he was. Yeah. He was just a shifty guy that you could not be trusted. He was also a pain in the butt. He just was. He right? ran his mouth off too. But I mean, the thing with this is like when he goes out to the Western theater, and this doesn't get mentioned a lot, this is the equivalent to when Sheridan goes to the Eastern Theater and you have Warren and Sheridan. This is the same level of ego going on here. The two do not like each other at all. And and Hooker is Hooker is the senior officer. He is above Blackjack and he's also above the other guy that is a possible replacement. Right. And you knew damn well, Sherman, if he did promote a guy like Joe Hooker, he'd be looking over his shoulder because Sherman ideally was going to probably want his job eventually, exactly. realistically speaking. Yeah. That, and that's, that was probably a factor, too. The third guy is a guy, Mary, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but his name is Oliver Otis Howard, <laughs> okay? Now, now he also he also struggled in Chancellorsville, to say the least. He certainly did. Um, he's still running, by the way. Yeah. But he was, he was reliable. Um, but he had a reputation of being a shaky field commander amongst his peers. And he just, he just did. He just, yep. now you could debate whether or not it's fair or not. And, you know, you know, Gettysburg people think he did well. Some people think he did, but what, what, whatever reputation preceded him that he was somebody who could not be trusted as a field commander by just by certain people. He was supported heavily by George, the rock of Thomas, right? Oh no. Oh no. It's not like we said before. He's going to say, oh no. Oh yes. Oh no, supported oh oh and this one heavily, right? <laughs> he certainly did. And he had that quote. He's in all of um what Thomas said about Howard was you cannot do better than to put Howard in command. Now, Thomas was a very respected guy by a lot of people, especially Sherman. So that had to carry a long weight, a lot of weight. So Sherman was certainly comfortable with Howard, 
Um, and ultimately, it was going to be Oliver Otis Howard who will be chosen to replace Burbsy McPherson to command an army of the Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about some of the, the fallout that happened with this. Obviously, Joe Hooker was not very thrilled about this decision, Mary. No, nope. he mean uh, girls it how, out of there, too. We all, we all know how us, how us Massachusetts men get were in bad moods, Mary. We all know that. Oh, but I, yes. It's yeah. a lot like a Canadian in a bad mood on a Tuesday. Uh, tell me about it but that's how that <laughs> so that 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 was the big that was the school for the most part heading up this part of the campaign for for, for sherman yeah so a little bit more background about this because there's a little bit of drama that goes on behind the scenes with this so you've got these three that are potentials and we know right away that hooker is not happening he he can be nixed off the list right away just because sherman is like fuck that. I am not having that guy in charge. The other problem too is like Slocum is all the way up in Vicksburg right now because he didn't get along with Hooker. And he bitched Mm -hmm. so much when he got out to the Western theater, they're like, just send that guy up to Vicksburg. So we don't have to listen to him, you know? And, and like you said, you know, Hooker has had successes on this Atlanta campaign, but it's the ego thing. He runs his mouth and he just doesn't, he's just that guy in the bar. Well, look at that. It's like Darius couch wanting to know part of him. He left. Yeah. Took took he took one of those defenses of Pennsylvania after Chancellorsville yeah. because he had wanted nothing to do. So he is a toxic personality to say the least. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so Sherman is definitely, we can nix him right away. So the other one is Blackjack Logan. So Sherman goes to Thomas to discuss who he should have in charge. And Sherman says, Well, Blackjack is in charge right now. What do you think? And what was Thomas's response to that? Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. No, that, that was probably his response because Thomas does not like Black Jack Logan. Before the Atlanta campaign began, shockingly, there was a bit of drama between the two of them. Um, uh, the Army of the Tennessee was operating outside the limits of its department, which was on the east side of the Mississippi River. And the transportation for that was reliant upon Thomas's Army of the Cumberland. So in March of 1864, Logan goes to Sherman to complain that Thomas is restricting the use of the railways by requiring passes. And Logan just thinks I should just be able to freely use them. And then um, Thomas is like, oh no, you can't use the railways. Um, So Sherman tells Thomas that he wants, he's thinking of Logan. And Thomas said, Logan is a troublesome fellow and he was hard to get along with. And then Thomas goes even further. If you put Logan in charge, I will resign. I'm going to leave. So then that's when uh, Sherman's like, okay, well then um, what do you think of Howard? <laughs> and that's, that's where we get, that's where we get Howard. But I don't think it was just Thomas's decision. Like um, Sherman said that he needed men that were soldiers that were going to follow orders, um, you know, and also that had that, you know, that training from West Point that was the administrative side of things. Um, And he felt that Howard actually had a lot more experience and could handle that part of it more so than Blackjack could. And I think that that really plays into it. Yeah, One guy who really didn't get considered, who probably could have, would have been Francis Blair, actually. Who was who was companion of the 17th yes. Corps here? Yeah, but yeah. he Blair wasn't was part. Of, he wasn't part of the equation for the most part. But Howard's going to be the guy. I think he was a safe choice. I think he yeah. fell, but obviously Sherman was going to keep his eye on him. But so now it's set up on the Union side where Oliver Otis Howard is now in charge of the Army of the Tennessee. Yeah, as they're beginning that really important phase of this campaign. Yeah. It was actually really funny when um, Sherman and Howard are out riding the lines um, one day and. Sherman said, how would you like McPherson's army to command? And Howard responded, I have a good corps and and I am satisfied. And as General Hooker's senior to me in rank, he may be deeply offended. And Howard kept saying that, you know, no, 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 it should be Hooker. I don't want to, you know, he doesn't want to cause shit, right? And then so Sherman just point blank says to him, Hooker has not the moral qualities that I want, not adequate to command. But if you don't want the promotion, there's plenty who do. And Howard's just like, Okay, I'm grateful for your confidence and that of General Thomas, and I will undertake anything you want me to. I'll take it. And that's when he just like, and Sherman, like he he does say that he he wanted to succeed in taking Atlanta. And in order to do that, he felt he needed soldiers that were purely and technically soldiers, 
men who would obey orders and execute them promptly and on time, for I knew that we would have to execute some delicate maneuvers requiring the utmost skill, um, nicety, and precision. And I believe that General Howard would do all those all these faithfully and well, and I think the result justified my, my choice. And the reason that Sherman knows this is that because uh, he and Howard fought together in the battles for Chattanooga, which we all know how Missionary Ridge went for Sherman. But from there, Sherman does gain a respect for Howard, and the two of them actually have become quite good friends. And he actually writes him in December of 1863, just telling him, telling Howard how much he respects him and that he hopes that they can work together in the future. So I think this is a decision based on not just the fact that Howard is from West Point and that he's he's had the experience, but also that Sherman has fought with all these men and he sees him as being this, this one guy that is a soldier that is going to obey and that's what he needs. Yeah, he needed he needed a steady Eddie is what he needed. Yeah, somebody who wasn't going to rock the boat. Somebody who had something to prove. Somebody who was more important about wanting to fight defensively, and somebody who he wasn't going to wasn't going to be a pain in the ass. So really, if you think about it, Howard really does check off all the boxes. He really yeah. really does, right? Yeah, he's not going to be a he's not going to be a drama queen. He's not going to be like Hooker who mean girls it out of the Western theater by basically his last words are, "Oh yeah, Chanchersville was lost because of Oliver Otis Howard." And then he fucks mm -hmm. off and leaves like he's, you know, and but as we're going to see, like Blackjack is not going to be happy with this decision. But Howard does a lot to make sure that he shows that he respects him. All right. Now, on the other side of the equation is the Confederacy and their deal wants a lot of changes themselves and John Bell Hood. He's going to take over the Army of Tennessee in July of 1864. So as we, we talked about this one of the previous episodes. Jefferson Davis thinks that Joseph E. Johnson is not being aggressive enough against Sherman. So he wants an aggressive guy. He wants someone who is rare to get in there. So he's mm -hmm. going to pick John Bell Hood. Now, John Bell Hood will say right off the bat, this is not 1862, 63 John Bell Hood. He's been injured. He's been busted up a little bit. You know, he re resembles the Red Knight more than he does John Bell Hood from previous years. Mm -hmm. He's somebody who has paid, you know, he's paid the price and he has, but it's, yeah. it, it definitely does take its toll. Now, Hood, because he gets promoted to the Army of Tennessee, he needs to find a new corps commander for his old corps because mm -hmm. he ain't doing it anymore. So he also has three choices, okay? His first choice is Patrick Claiborne. Marry yeah. your friend Patrick, old Patty yeah. boy, right? Irish guy, real strong record. Um, he's very close with William Hardy, which yeah. is not a good thing because Hood hates him. He also wrote that emancipation plan where he wanted to free the black sol the slaves to make them Confederate soldiers. Yeah. And that was political suicide for exactly. anybody who wanted to climb. So Patrick Claiborne, despite the fact that he probably would have been the best choice, is probably not going to be realistically considered. Now, nope. the second choice is Benjamin Cheatham. Another guy we've talked about, hard fighting guy, hard drinking guy. Likes to have a good time. He was, he certainly was, but he also had a reputation of being a complainer because of the experiences he had with Braxton Bragg in previous campaigns. But they're just like, it, these are the two that were at Kennesaw, you know, right. at what is now Cheatham's Hill. And they're such, they're, they're aggressive, but not to the point of being, you know, stupid about it. Well, I think either of those choices would have been a good one. Oh, Cheatham would have been. If you look at you know, Cheatham, would have been. If yeah. you're trying to, if you're trying to compare the decision that Sherman had versus the decision that Hood had, mm -hmm. Hood had a tougher choice because he had he had better guys to choose from. Admittedly, yeah. I think Sherman picked the right guy. I think Hood clearly chose poorly, if you ask me. Okay. Yeah. So the third guy is uh, is Stephen D. Lee. Now he's a distant cousin of Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. He commanded a group called the Department of the Alabama and Mississippi, which is outside of Hood's army. So he's not even part of the Army of Tennessee. He's popular. The troops mm -hmm. like him. He had the confidence of a lot of his generals, a lot of his peers, a lot of the senior guys. He's also he's West... friends with John Bell Hood, too. He's friends with Hood, but, you know, he, but he also has a lot of support from others. E.P. Alexander, he mm -hmm. says he's a natural-born soldier. Jefferson Davis, the head of the Confederacy, he, the president, he says... That uh, of, of Stephen D. Lee, one of the best soldiers this war ever produced. So what Hood is going to do is he is going to think about one of these three guys. Now, now that all sounds well and good for those quotes, 
but Lee had some had some issues. Okay, he was in charge of that that of that department of Alabama, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. He was pr- for the most part defending Mississippi pretty well against the Union for the most part. He does get in trouble at a battle called the Battle of Tupelo, where he gets completely punked on this one. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is he goes up against an entrenched Union army with more numbers and attacks and attacks them frontally is what he does, yep. which is kind of foreshadowing what this battle is going to be. And many in the South, despite the fact that they got whipped up pretty good, the Southern press, which was more Southern propaganda at this point, felt that this was a big Southern victory. For whatever yeah, reason, they, they made could, it they out could. to be just completely into a victory. And that's like, you know, the thing with, with Stephen D. Lee is he, he's coming into this well-respected, but his track record is just not, and again, it goes back to the experience, like Cheatham and Claiborne have the experience. Hood, I think is picking him because he's his friend and they went to West Point together. And that's another interesting thing to note about this battle is um, Hood, Lee and Howard were all at West Point at the same time. And Howard and Stephen D. Lee are actually friends. Yeah. Now, Lee was outranked by both Cheatham and Claiborne, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, Stephen D. Lee never led an infantry division, never led a corps at this point. Um, he wasn't in the Army of Tennessee. He didn't know Atlanta, didn't know the terrain, didn't, didn't know, know anything, troops. right? Didn't, didn't know anything. Could barely say Chattahoochee, <laughs> right? Was, look how far you've come in 50 episodes, weeks. One day after this podcast, I learned how to say Chattahoochee. So you get a gold star. Oh, thank you so much. Despite <laughs> all of this, despite all of these things, Hood is going to inexplicably choose Stephen D. Lee to command a core, okay, in his army. Um, I think part of it too is I think he probably didn't see Lee as a threat to his power because yep. don't forget he was newly appointed too. And he'd been and, lobbying behind the scenes. You know. You know, Jefferson Davis was changing these these commanders, you know, the way you, you change cans out of the refrigerator every 30 seconds for the most part. And so I think what happened was he wanted to okay. make sure he, he didn't bring somebody in who was going to maybe be too good, maybe. And I'm just speculating yeah. here. Either that or he really, really, really hoped he'd be like Robert E. Lee. He thought maybe there was some lineage. Who knows? But whatever it was, he thought he really hoped this was going to be the best. Now, we'll tell you right off the bat. This was not Hood's best day here. He clearly had lost the fastball at this point for whatever oh, reason he didn't. Yeah. You know, but Lee's choice was was questioned at the time. But you know what? Hood said, Frig, YOLO. We'll go with we'll go with Stephen D. Lee. So that he's going to command a core in this battle. Now, Howard, on the 27th of July, 1864, um, Sherman is gonna is gonna have him move. His, this, his new command, the Army of the Tennessee, west of the city to the right end of the Union Army. He's going to move him pretty quick. Mm-hmm. What he wants to do, he wants to cut Hood's last railroad supply line, the Macon and Western Railroad. He wants this the only line entering Atlanta that's not destroyed at this time. Yeah. And, and Sherman knows that if he cuts off this line, Hood's going to have to withdraw from the city realistically. That's going to be it because it's, yeah. the, it's the only way in and out. So that, that's what this, that's what's going to happen with this. Now, Hood on the 27th, he's not stupid. He knows that's probably what he's going to want to do. So Hood gets, uh, he anticipates Sherman's move is going to attack that, that Macon and Western Railroad. He got some intel by John, um, the old war child Wheeler from the cavalry yeah. that they were moving in that direction. So he's like, okay, I, I know what he's doing. Um, they knew they were moving in that direction. He knew that's where the train line was. He probably said, well, that's got to be what they're doing because that's what I would do. He's going to use Stephen D. Lee's core, that new core, to intercept Howard and stop and stop him. He's going to defend a road called the Lick Skillet Road, which just sounds a fantastic name for a road, by the way. Lick Skillet, Lick Skillet Road. But Is that the, the road job- that leads into Rough and Ready? Oh, my goodness gracious. There's some tough times, some hard times on that road, Mary. <laughs> but, but, but. Stephen D. Lee, and this is the thing that's interesting about this plan, is this is a defensive thing. This is not to attack. This is to defend. He mm-hmm. wants his troops to get up on that Lick Skillet Road on a ridge line, okay, and set up their line to get ready to hit Howard as he approaches Howard. He is then going to use Alexander Stewart, A.P. Stewart, his corps. Once this happens, once he has Howard engaged and stopped, he wants Stewart to go around Howard's right flank and hit. Now, 
Howard had a reputation, and everybody knows it, that he could be turned on his flank pretty easily. Yeah. And I think Hood had assumed that Howard probably had learned his lesson because he was going to try it again. So in his mind, he was going to set up that defensive line on Lick Skillet Road using, using Stephen D. Lee, mm -hmm. get them engaged, get them locked up. And then once it's the shit's hitting the fan, he's going to send um, – He's going to send Stewart on the right flank where he must have assumed Howard would not defend and he was going to counterattack and he was going to absolutely pound him and that and that was going to achieve two goals. It was going to it was going to slow Sherman's march, slow his roll, and what it was going to do is it was going to protect the railroad. So that's that's really in a nutshell what it was is what he wanted to do and and as we talk about this battle going forward the plan goes off the wagon pretty quickly. It, it, it does. And so the thing is, is like Sherman has started this plan before Howard is even in charge. And it's Blackjack that actually starts this. He starts, you know, making preparations and all that. He finds out in the 26th, like, yeah, you're not in charge anymore. Here's OO, your new commander. Have fun with that. Um, the, the thing that happens on the, over on the Confederate side is John Bell Hood gives a speech. Now it's not as bad as that that speech that uh, um, what's his face at P Ridge gives. I'm blanking on his name, Earl Van Dorn. <laughs> it's not as bad as that speech, um, but but he says, experience has proved to you that safety in the time of battle consists into getting into the close quarters with your enemy. They will be in peril if the enemy keep and Hood tells them you're going to be in peril if the enemy keeps flanking you out of position. He said. You have to will it, and God will grant you the victory your commander and your country expect. So he's basically tell them, go right up there. You might be fucked, but go get me a victory. You know, he's 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 trying to get his troops to become aggressive because at this point, the troops are already not very happy that that Hood is in charge. Johnston was the favorite, mm -hmm. um, but Howard is going to take his men he's going to arrive there and he's going to immediately start entrenching. Yeah. And hoods, hoods plans a good one actually, yeah. except the problem is, there's a few problems is his, he has a new general in charge of it. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. now, now, now John Bell hood, he's got 99 problems, but aggressive the same one of them. Okay. That's the deal. Now, the problem with this plan is there's really, a, there's really a handful of issues that hoods plan has wrapped up. So first of all, it assumed that when, when, Lee got there, Ezra Church was going to be, no one was going to be there. No one's going to be there, yeah. He assumed that he'd be the first one there, and they would arrive, and that that ridge line at the Lick Skillet Row would be unoccupied. That was that was, that was was a big problem yeah. with that. Um, so his army could set up those defenses before Howard got there, despite the fact that Howard had left earlier, which I don't know how the it, hell he figured that. It, so Howard exactly. goes earlier, and but he's thinking, we're going to get there first, and that's the big problem. His entire plan depends on getting there first. There's no plan B if Howard's there first. He no, never said no, plan B. There's right? no contingency plan. And they're also going to assume that the Federals are going to make mistakes. Yeah. The other thing he does, he assumes that Howard is not going to defend his flank because the reputation he has. He thinks that, well, okay, Howard's going to sit there. And when we hit them, when Stewart hits the right flank, they're going to run like sheep and that just like Chancellorsville because that's the reputation he has. He doesn't assume that Howard might have learned at this point. That's the other problem. Um, he also, you know, he assumed that his generals were going to communicate and exactly. they didn't. And so yeah. th and that, that's the biggest problem with this. He assumed that Lee, that Lee Stewart and his cavalry guy led by William Jackson, Jackson yeah. were all going to get together and talk about this as this was flowing. And they didn't at all. So you can kind of see where this is going. Now, the big issue, and the, the one that's that the, the Hood people don't want to talk about, is Hood wasn't there. He Unlike wasn't. Sherman, who did come with Howard, Howard, I mean, Hood stayed back in Atlanta, four miles away at his headquarters. So you've got new a new general in charge with a plan that has really one way to work and a million ways not to, and he's not there. He does Hood does nothing to coordinate the attacks. And he placed no single person in charge because you have two corps commanders, Lee and Stewart. Okay, neither of them were told who was in charge of who. Nope. There was no one who was really the headliner on the field. So you can kind of see now Howard did have full command on the other side of, of his army. I mentioned Sherman was with him 
to help coordinate those movements. This and is Howard, his sole time. This is his first time ever commanding an army, like a whole army, you know? You know, Howard, you know, in his, of course, Howard is Howard. He's going to be cautious. He's going to be slow as he probably should have been. So Howard knows Hood and he knows Hood's aggressive and he knows Hood is going to hit him somewhere soon. And he's expecting it at any moment. So he kind of crawls towards Ezra Church and that railroad. Um, he didn't know it at the time, but his his adversary was still in Atlanta. Lee was still in Atlanta. Yeah, Lee point. was held back because Hood thought you know, that, that Sherman might attack. So he holds him back. And then all of a sudden he's like, okay, go. And by then it's too late. And so Howard has that opportunity to set up when, when Lee, Stephen D. Lee's entire plan was based on the fact they were going to get there first and entrench. There was no alternative if they got there and Howard was already there. There was not, there was no even thinking about it. Lee finally gets going and it's just like today. It's hot. It's sticky. It's a full gold bond powder situation for the boys. And mm. they've got to walk on that typical Atlanta July day through all that crap. And they also have to move quickly because they know in their minds they got to stay ahead of Howard, right? By the time they get by the time they get there or get nearby, the troops are already already exhausted. So yeah. on on dawn of July 28th, the day of the battle, the federal troops start they they're getting close to the area. They start running into Confederate cavalry at this point. Yeah. Um, in the woods near Ezra Church. Now the woods around Ezra Church is thick. I mean, it's it's dense. It's a forest, and that causes some problems for the Union as well. Um, Howard again is still fearing that imminent attack by Hood. At any point, he's going to be attacked. And Sherman's telling him, Sherman's like, "You're not going to get attacked." And and so the Howard's going into this with not just the ghost of Chancellorsville following him, and that's quite evident by the way when he sets up his troops. He's very careful how to set them up. And as he's setting them up, he's making sure his flanks are protected because he mm -hmm. said to Sherman, I'm going to be attacked. And Sherman's like, no, 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 you're not. And Blackjack actually had said the same thing to Sherman. We're going to get attacked when we go to this position. And Sherman kept saying, I, I don't think so. But so like Howard is setting up his men very carefully, not just because of Chancellorsville, but because he went to school with John Bell Hood. He's uh -huh. his classmate at West Point and he knows him. Howard at this point has no idea that he is going to be fighting against his friend, Stephen D. Lee, because the union doesn't know, know that that change has happened. They don't know who they're going up against, but Howard's like, this is Hood. He's going to attack me. He's aggressive. Howard actually wrote his wife and said, Hood is stupid, but he's aggressive. Uh -huh. But Howard, I mean, he he's cautious on a scale of zero to mcclellan he's a solid nine on his speed with this one he takes <laughs> his time to set up and he's going to extend his divisions one at a time he's yep. going to personally place them it's going to be really really quiet and he's keeping an eye a close eye on his flanks because it's because obviously he is going to be um sherman says okay well you do you but i wish you kind of hurry you know i want you to i want you to uh i want you to go but he doesn't interfere in in, in howard he keeps him going so by 11 o'clock in the morning, all of his troops are in, for Howard are all in position along that ridge line north of that Lick Skillet Road, mm -hmm. the place that Hood had intended to place his troops. So Howard smartly is going to refuse his right flank now. So now he's in a good position. He's all entrenched. He has his right, right flank refused, and it's all centered around an area of that, of that Ezra, Ezra Church. And again, Boys will be boys. They have an upside down popsicle mo, you know, situation. That's how they set <laughs> how, how they set that up. Um, but but what Howard does, he's taking the time while he's there to take down trees. He's going to build entrenchments, and he's pretty happy about the situation. He he's yeah. he knows he's got a, he's got a good situation. He's stuck in the middle of the woods, which is an issue because he doesn't have artillery placements. But he's got a good he's got good breastworks. He's got a good defensive line, yep. and he has his right line his right flank refused. Yeah, Howard will say that in his memoirs that it was more the infantry with their rifles that repulsed the attacks during the battle than it was the artillery because it was so difficult to place, but he was quite happy with, with how things were set up. So around 10 a.m., you have General John C. Brown's division of Lee's Corps. Um, they are gonna be coming in to attack and as he goes in, he gets reports from Confederate cavalry that the Yankees were in their front and that they were already entrenched. 
And so immediately Hood's plan is thrown off. Yeah, I mean, right so the revs are coming, they're getting from Atlanta, they're, they're coming down that Lick Skillet Road, yeah. just, you know, chancing with the where they're singing along, right? John C. Brown's division, the other John Brown, Mary, um, and they're coming down now. Lee and Brown, they're hearing these rumors that the, from the Calvary, the Union is, is in the area, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the skirmishes ahead of them are on the Lick Skillet Road, right? That this, this, there's troops that are definitely there. Lee is thinking that the troops are just light skirmishers, right? Yeah. They're thinking that they're just, they're just okay, there are going to be people out here, with, but they're just skirmishers. We're not going to worry so much about it. He still thinks he has the initiative because he still thinks that he's there before Howard. He, he doesn't realize Howard's already there. He's already, you know, he's just doing all the, all the Howard things he's doing, right? <laughs> setting, up the, setting up the track. He's doing everything he's going to do, you know? He's doing Bible study before they you know? go in. And so he, you know, um, he's thinking, okay, we'll get up. It's, this is going to be a quick defensive. We're going to set up our defensive tax. He's going to come. We're going to hit him. And then we're going to route him. He's, already, he's still confident at this point. So Lee is going up this bad intelligence, this bad intel that this is, he's got skirmishes in front of him and nobody else. Yeah. He's going to order John C. Brown's division to attack as soon as possible. And with his four brigades, talking the third, the 18th, 26th, and 32nd Tennessee. So he's going to lead them all into it, despite the fact that Henry Clayton isn't there yet. So exactly. remember the original, now keep in mind in your, in your little head there, okay? The original plan all along, it's already going off the trail. He's told, you know, by Hood, don't bring on a general engagement, set up a defense. Now he's talking about sending in four brigades to attack a position. Right off the bat, it, the, the plan's going off yeah. the wagon. He also was supposed to wait um, he was supposed to, you know, supposed to wait for um, Clayton, and he does. He he doesn't do that. He goes right in. So Brown's going to open the attack, which is the first of four failures. This is the first attack on this position. Yeah. Um, through these dense woods, immediately right off the bat, he has communication issues again. He doesn't even see the Union line until he was right on top of them. He thought he so, was going to surprise the, what he thought were the skirmishers. And then so it's like, oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> They're walking up, and all of a sudden, they see the Union army rise and fire a hellacious, brutal volley right into yeah. these Confederates from behind these entrenchments, which made that rebel advance impossible. So right off the bat, you've got the pucker effect immediately, yeah. okay? So he's like, well, okay. Um Bill, you know, it, 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 we're going to talk about the carnage as this goes. You know, in Brown's division, a guy named Private Philip Stevenson, he talks about this initial volley. He says, yeah. gallant charges were made, but the attack became one-sided and it was a humiliating defeat. Now, he was either talking about Ezra Church or the Indians game the night before. It was one or the other, okay? okay. But, but you will talk about, you talk about how quickly they were surprised and how hard it was. But this is where the, the mistakes really continue to be, you know, you know, continue to along. The Rebs are going to try this again. And this is going to be the same game plan over and over and over again. Yeah. They're going to try to attack that red, that Union right flank now. And already, now they're not waiting for Stewart. They're going to go right at the flank right now. And Howard's ready. And he drives them back pretty easily. So the Rebs marched four miles in the brutal heat, went straight into battle that they weren't ready for. So right off the... So, so when you're thinking about the initial game plan, think of a football game. The game plan, first play of the first quarter is out the window. So now, you, now you're chasing your tail already. Exactly. And the other thing, too, is that Howard and Blackjack are both able to throw in their reserves when needed. They have planned for this very, very well. And the next attack that comes in is going to be uh, General Henry Delamar Clayton's attack. And he's ordered, he and his division arrives as Brown is attacking and he's ordered in and he fares no better than Brown. Communication again is still really, really horrible. Um, the one thing that happens is um, a guy named Gibson has his Louisianans here and he's ordered in before the rest of divi the division because Lee bypasses Clayton and goes right to him and says attack and doesn't bother to tell Clayton that. Mm -hmm. The fighting is very, very, very vicious. This is fighting that's going to happen near Ezra Church. And then they end up drawing 400 yards into a ravine. And they're like, fuck this. We can't keep doing this. No, and you look at Randall Gibson as Louisiana's. I mean, he's forced to 
charge Leroy Jenkins style into this. Yeah. And so again, it goes back to communication again, right? So there was so many issues at all. Jacob Brantley, an officer in, the, uh, in Tennessee, he says extreme heat, a scarcity of water in a hurried manner, which we entered the engagement. That's why they got beaten back. And so Gibson, you know, he, um, he gets beat back pretty quickly. Now Clayton, um, we talked before about Henry Clayton, he's going to keep attacking that, that union line and taking heavy casualties. Now this is like a hammer hitting the nail over and over and over and over again. Um, while Gibson's men are getting smoked, Clayton orders a guy named Alpheus Baker's Alabamans to attack right at the center of the Ezra church. So that's, that's where he's going to go. Mm -hmm. And they got hit hard and driven back as well. And it was a repeating, repeating thing. So by noontime, 1230, give or take, the die has been cast where this battle's going. And at mm -hmm. some point, Stephen D. Lee probably would have had someone say, okay, we need to reform, rethink this. But the guy who would have said that to him in John Bell Hood is not there. Not there. So he, he has to follow his plan. Now, the plan went out the window, but he decided to do his own thing. So by 1230, the third attack is going to begin. Manigault. This, Arthur Manigault, his, his brigade of Alabamans and South Carolinians, they are ordered to attack the Union position and hold that ridge near Ezra Church. Okay, that sounds like the original plan. Sounds good. Brown told him, according to Manigault, this is according to him, you'll have no problem taking it because to Sharp's division a little while ago uh, in Brown, who was in Brown Center, they got up there. So you'll have no problem now. Now they're weak and now you can get right up there. So no problem. So Manigold goes in, immediately gets his ass handed to him, right? They fall back after the Fed's counter charge. Manigold's going to try again. Same thing's going to happen. Yeah. Um, he's going to get actually within about 20 feet of the federal line. They do get, get pretty close. close. They do. Some of these guys, right. they do. It is close at some points in this battle. Right. So they fall back again. So now... They're thinking about a third time. Third time's a charge. Now he's got about 700 guys left. Yeah. And he started with about 1,000. So he's running. He's, the attrition's running running by now. So by now, Manigold sees this thing as a joke. He says, this is an absolute freaking, there's no mm -hmm. freaking way this is going to happen. Um, he goes to Brown and begs him to his division commander. We got to stop this shit. This mm -hmm. is not going to work. We have to stop. Yeah. And Brown says, you know something? I wish I could stop you. This is Stephen Dealey's game. I don't have the orders to stop you, so you have to go in. And so he's like, all right, well, I guess I'll have to. So he's, this is where it gets interesting, though. And Brown, John Brown has one of those moments where maybe a little bit of conscience. As soon as Manigold goes to start his third attack, Brown stops him and says, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah. I'll take the heat. Well, I can't send you back up there again. That's and an he absolute still throws murder. Manigold under the bus during in his after battle. Well, well, that's the best part about it. And so <laughs> he says, Brown says, I'll take responsibility, but he does blame him. And yeah. he's he says that Manigold didn't fight hard enough. And um he did admit though, he did admit that the the Howard had a good defensive position, had more guys, but he does say that he didn't get there because he didn't fight hard enough. So again, it's the whole cover your ass thing is how yeah. it goes. Yeah. And then we have um, Stuart finally arriving yep. on the scene and he's going to throw in uh, General Edward C. Walthall. So yep. he attacks while Loring is still coming up and forming. And this is around two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, he goes in and it's the same thing just absolute well, carnage gets repulsed well alexander stewart's interesting guy though this is the fourth that this is the fourth attack so alexander stewart he's from mississippi from biloxi okay just like you he's a former math teacher right from from nashville and oh, um, he's a math teacher too and if, like after the war like every failed confederate he he becomes an insurance salesman apparently because that's <laughs> what he does but what's interesting about him mary uh, maybe you don't know this but in 1908, he was named the first commissioner for the Chickamauga Chattanooga National Battlefield Park. So that's what that was his job after the war. So it's very, very interesting cool. how he was. And um, but he does his fourth attack. So Ezra, his his corps is approaching the fields, and he sets up in front of Lee's two absolutely broken divisions. This this, this friggin' busted up, right? Yeah. At this point, Hood's plan is completely out the window. Again. 
gets a lick, lick skill of bridge, ridge, set up, defend, hit Howard when he gets there, and then hit him on his flank. That's the plan in a nutshell. Basically keep them from the railway, which they right. are managing to keep them from the railway, but they are getting fucking decimated while doing it. Like this battle is, we'll talk about yeah. this um, in the aftermath. It's horrible. It is. Now, Lee, Stephen D. Lee, instead of, ha instead of having Stuart attack Howard's flank, which is per the original plan, he's going to have Stuart attack with Edward Walthall, to, you, to your point we just mentioned. He's going to attack where Brown had tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. He's going to keep doing that. And of course, it's going to lead to yet another uncoordinated, messy, bloody attack because there's no way they could take that position. There's just no way. Lee still thinks, though, the Lions can crack under the attack. He still thinks so. He's still confident for whatever reason. He's confident that despite all the bloodshed and the repeated failures, you know, that which, which is turning into a two below 2.0, by the way, it really, I really is. I think we're seeing like he, he's kind of like Hood Jr. in a way. Yeah, I think because the communication and all the coordination, all the issues they had, it was leading to a disaster just like Tupelo. And it was just, you know, um, Walthall, of course, has got the same exact results. He's Walthall's actually going to suffer the worst casualties of any division of this. They're the ones yes. who are going to get really beaten up with this. And this that phrase, have an average of 30% casualties for all yeah, the wounds will be. thrown in. So that definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. That's yeah. what this is. This, this is insanity. So Stephen D. Lee is going to keep doing this repeatedly. He's going to keep hitting him, hitting his thumb with the hammer and wondering why it keeps hurting, but he keeps doing it. Walthall's division fails again. This is the fourth fail now. And they fall back to be protected by William Loring's division, who's going to basically be there to protect him. And this is when they start losing officers, right? So around this time, Loring is going to get shot in the chest. Now, he's going to live, mm -hmm. but he's going to be taken out of the picture. He's going to be out. We mentioned Alexander Stewart. He's going to get hit in the head or the forehead with something, some kind of shrapnel, but he's going to get nicked. He will live too, and he'll be taken out of the battle as well. And this is where Cheatham is finally going to get to take over, you know, take over yeah. his core. Yeah. But now, you couple the fact that Stephen Dealey is losing his troops at a ghastly pace. Now he's losing command, field commanders. You're not talking about sergeants and cabinets. He's losing generals and he's losing corps commanders now. So this is continuing on and on and on. The butcher's bill gets higher and higher yeah. and higher as this goes on. It just, There's... and, you know, there's a Tennessee regiment that um, loses, goes through seven commanders. They they do. One they, they after the other. The 49th, is it the 49th? The, they lose, right. They, they lose one, then two, then three. Whoever takes over, yeah. it's like the drummer for, for Spinal Tap. You, have, yep. you, you name that, you're done. You're, you're out. And that's what <laughs> happened with them, right? Now, Howard, okay, sitting on the Union side, He's 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 thrilled. I mean, he's sitting back watching Lee run into you know he's watching Lee run into the fan over and over and over again. Exactly, and, well, laughing, he, and he and Blackjack right? are able to throw in their reserves when they need to, and they're like he and Blackjack seem to be working very well together in this because Blackjack is the one name that comes up more than Howard as much as Howard's in this battle. Now, yes, Sherman is here, but he does take a step back. You know, like he's not really telling Howard what to do. Howard's making his own decisions here, but it, it's quite evident, you know, like not only is this showing that that Howard's able to conduct himself in battle in charge of an army, but Blackjack Logan is having a good day here too. They're both throwing in the reserves that they need to, putting the men mm -hmm. where they need to be. Um, and it, it's going quite well for them. You know, I had heard somewhere that Oliver Otis Howard didn't have an aggressive bone in his body, Mary. Okay, I, I did too. But I'll tell you, okay, there is allegedly Howard's army fired a million shots at this battle. Yep. Now, I'm not sure if that's true. It's a lot of numbers. But one thing is true is they were firing so heavy and so hot that when they were putting the powder into the rifles, they were sparking. That. They were yep. lighting up. That's how hot the barrels were. That's how hard these Union guys were fighting. So he, Howard's guys were fighting really, really hard. The casualties on the rebel side were appalling absolutely appalling and most people think that this battle was the most vicious of any of the atlantic campaigns including yeah. cheatham hill okay um sergeant eugene mcwain 127th illinois mary i'm gonna quote him says the rebs lied the rebs laid in line of battle behind a chestnut rail fence dead as stones 
our balls pass through the rails as if they were paper. So just imagine the situation where these rebels are behind these fences and they're just getting drilled and drilled and just dropping dead and they're yeah. lining up. Some said it was perfect murder. They called yeah. this. And that was that was a phrase they said. Yeah. The feds were sitting back and they were stunned that the rebs kept coming. They just kept going and going and going. And you got to wonder, like, um, you know, one person said the rebs are caught in the open and slaughtered. Are some of these men on the union side that, no, I guess they wouldn't, they wouldn't be at Franklin, but that sounds a lot like Franklin. I was going to say, if any of them ended up being at Franklin, would they not just look at this and be like, holy shit, Mm -hmm. this is like Ezra Church. But we do know that there's men fighting here on the Confederate side that are going to be fighting at Franklin. And you got to wonder if they're thinking the same thing, like, holy fuck. I think one thing that separates the two is the weather. Franklin was cold. Yeah, Franklin. This was yeah, hot exactly. as hell. Yeah. So you picture you're in a situation where you've got the black powder, you got the guns, the, the guns are hot as hell. You're fighting that hot Georgia sun. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yes, but by so by day's end, by close to the end of the day, Lee finally wakes up from his antifreeze hangover and says, "You know something? This is this is a waste of time." So he sees the futility of the attacks and finally calls it off. He drops back and sets up a defensive position. All along, while Howard, I mean, why Hood is still back, he's still back in Atlanta. Even after all of this, after four failed attacks, Hood is staying in his headquarters in Atlanta. Yeah. And we mentioned it wasn't his best day, losing his fastball, whatever you want to call it. He never left his headquarters at any point, which is surprising considering how aggressive he was and how new Stephen D. Lee's command was, right? Exactly. So, but he was still issuing orders. And this what was interesting about it, though, is whether we talk about the communication, he, he was four miles away, four yeah. miles. Okay, he was issuing orders that were taking forever to get there. Okay, and I said before, Mary, you with your little Canadian legs could roller skate backwards quicker with your whistle <laughs> on your headband, listen to disco <laughs> faster than it took for the messengers to get from Atlanta to, to Ezra Church for, for whatever. Actually, I reason. would be singing "Call Me" maybe. Okay. Well, by the time the messages, by the time the messages got there, the battle was over already. And so the whole question is, what is up with Hood, right? Now, there's rumors that his physical stuff was going on. But whatever, whatever the issue was, he was delinquent to everything with this. He had no part of this. He was not up front where he should have been. He stayed back at the headquarters. And he let this happen while it was going on. He didn't seem to be abreast of what was going on because he thought they were still fighting defense right up until the very end. He was quite surprised that this happened. Now, Hood's original order is, again, was to hold that area at the Lickskillet Road. And we said this over and over and over again. And, 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 and then hit him when he can. Now, the feds are approaching. The feds, the Federal Union Army was approaching from a, de- from a defensive position. And what well, they did, they were going to protect him from that Macon in, in, uh, in Western Railroad. That was, yeah. Again, that's the, whole, that's the whole plan. And it all went to shit when they got there. And for whatever reason... There was no plan B of, okay, let's get there, and the union's already there. What do we do? Now, Hood, after the battle, was interesting about this. He doesn't criticize Stephen D. Lee, which is, which is mind-numbing. No. He actually praises him, and he doesn't say, you did a shitty job. You did, did the wrong things, um, and may, I think probably why he didn't want to – the guy he handpicked to do this, he didn't want to rip him because yeah. it would make him look bad, right? Yeah. Um, he does end up sending Hardy, though, to take over, which is kind of the actions versus the words. So you're saying, hey, Steve, D, you did nothing wrong. Oh, by the way, William Hardy is going to be taken over now. So it's kind of like, OK, well, what, what, what's yeah. more important? And he only spends like in his memoirs, Hood only spends like two paragraphs on this battle, whereas any other battle he's fought in, he spends like apparently like pages and pages and pages. But we're talking about a guy that he's been severely injured and I don't think he's like, you know, there's questions as to if he's like, really, was he physically fit to command an army? Like they have to lift him onto his horse. He's not the same John Bell hood that we saw in 1862 and early 1863. Right. You know? No, he was, he was, I mean, he was losing, you know, he was losing body parts. He was, he was psychological, who knows what psychological damage he was dealing with, but he certainly, you know, physically was having a tough time. Now, these casualty figures, now, they're not as, as grand as Antietam or Franklin. No. But when you look at the percentages, so the Confederates, out of 11,000 guys engaged, 
they lost 3,000 guys. And to your point, the number you hit a little while ago, that's, that's 30%, okay? That includes field commanders. You're talking about Stuart and Loring, um, as well as those all those several regimental commanders. So you have 30% of your, of your engaged people, people are, are casualties. Um, the Union, out of 9,000, they lose 600 guys. And that's because of what Howard did to set up the defensive position. Mm-hmm. And although Howard admittedly said, well, he, he claimed that the Rebs lost 7,000 guys, okay? Yeah, now, Howard's really, are a little bit. No, he could only count on one hand, so that was part of his problem, <laughs> but that's probably why he didn't have He was a math, a math right. professor, though. That's true. Well, who knows what his deal was, but he, he certainly didn't have that. Um, but certainly when you look at the fact that how many, the, the sheer firepower, I don't buy the million shots thing mm-hmm. because that that's a lot, okay? But if a million shots was true, on a one mile battlefield, that's 500 bullets per yard. Now, uh, that's a lot. I don't think that's, pr- I think it's more hyperbole because I don't think mm-hmm. that's true. But but the reality was, um, it talks about the pure carnage and the absolute hell these Confederates went through mm-hmm. because of bad communication, bad leadership from the beginning, and an uncoordinated mm-hmm. attack. So they got there and they flew by the seat of their pants, yeah. primarily because Stephen D. Lee's experience. Now, his primary battle experience was a Tupelo, and he did the same game plan. He attacked an entrenched position mm-hmm. and got his ass kicked, and that's what he did. Yeah. Isn't and he Stephen the one, though, D- that kind of kicked Sherman's ass at um, Chickasaw? Well, Sherman got, Sherman had his own moments, but you know, yeah. certainly. <laughs> but, but Stephen D. Lee, though, the thing about him is he doesn't assume any responsibility for no, this, doesn't. though. You know who he blames? He blames his own troops. Yep. He throws them all under the bus. He says, yep. I am convinced that if all the troops had displayed equal spirit, we would have been successful. And my question is this, Mary, to you. How do you take 30% casualties and then say your guys didn't show equal spirit? Exactly. It seems to me that they probably did if they had 30% casualties. Exactly. But that's what happens is now Hood, you know, um, doesn't he they they throw this one under the rug i mean all of them hood's memoirs you know how many pages he has in his memoirs yeah, it's, it's Ezra two Church? paragraphs it's just two paragraphs that he spends and he has spent he, like he will take pages and pages to talk about other battles and what he says he doesn't even see this as a loss and to no. your point you mentioned why the union never got the railroad no. here so in hood's mind they did defend it in his mind, they lost a bunch of guys in Italy, mm. but did Sherman and Howard get to the, the making a Western Railroad? No. So he says, and I quote, Ezra Church was not a defeat as no material advantage was gained by either side. So this would be one of those situations where you, you got your butt kicked pretty good, but you held. Even though he, they held by a really bad situation, but I don't see how you can take this as a W or even a tie. He didn't blame Lee, as I mentioned before. Um, but it's unusual, though, mm-hmm. that he didn't blame Lee, considering he blamed everybody except the Rosewoods clown for Franklin, <laughs> exactly. Right? exactly, which doesn't make any sense to me. So you're going to blame Claiborne and all these guys for Franklin, and you're not going to blame Stephen D. Lee for Ezra? And I think it all goes back to the fact that he put him in charge himself personally. Exactly. And it was a controversial move over yeah. Cheatham and Claiborne. And he, he couldn't blame him because it would make himself look bad. And I think yeah. that's a big part of it. Um, other guys, Arthur Manigold, who hated everybody at this point, he blames a loss on his lousy generals, which he was probably, out of all the people, he was probably right. And many yeah. of the soldiers felt the same. I think the confidence was completely lost in Hood at this battle. In yeah, the Army it was of shaky. It was shaky to begin with, but you know afterwards there's this kind of general dis like it's described as this one soldier said general dissatisfaction among the men of army of tennessee you know because johnston was the favorite the men liked him you know and yeah he's not the aggressive commander that davis wants but you know hood comes in and they're kind of like you know this is a guy who's sacrificed his body on the altar of the confederacy and he's he expects all his men to do the same thing. It's quite evident in that speech he gives before they go into this. It's like, yeah, don't worry. God will will it and you'll you'll win. Like we're expecting you to kind of thing, you know? Um, so yeah, there's in there was one guy that said it was a very savage battle and it was for severity unsurpassed by any in the campaign. 
And it's sort of, in some ways, I see it as foreshadowing Franklin. This is like a, like a mini version of Franklin, how they go in and they're absolutely slaughtered and they just keep going in and in and in, you know? Um, and now it's not as many casualties, but still it, it's a very horrific battle. Um, over on the Union side of things, you know, you have Oliver Otis Howard, who probably has one of his best days in the Civil War at this battle, you know, um, despite Sherman not believing there's going to be an attack, Howard makes sure his troops have the necessary fortifications and he's always keeping his flanks protected. And yes, part of that is the ghost of Chancellorsville and part of that is he knows who is attacking him. He knows mm -hmm. it's Hood. Now, the one thing that shocks Howard is when he finds out that it was actually his friend Stephen D. Lee that was doing the attacking. Mm -hmm. that that was because they were friends and he couldn't believe it. Um, but this is Howard's first battle after taking command of the Army of the Tennessee. And he said that I was delighted with the conduct of the officers and the men. And he especially praises Black Jack Logan in this. And I think some of this is because he knows what's just happened to Black Jack and he's trying to keep the peace with him. He says, right. Major General Logan was spirited and energetic going at once to the point where he apprehended the slightest danger of the enemy's success, his decision and resolution everywhere animated and encouraged the officers of the men. And um, he also said, I wish to express my high gratification with the conduct of the troops engaged. I never, I never conducted, I never better conducted in battle General Logan, though ill, um, ah, let me say that again. Um, I wish to express my high gratification with the conduct of the troops engaged. General Logan, though ill and much worn out, um, was in the, God, I can't talk tonight. Oh my God. Anyway, just let me start over. So basically he says that he loves what the troops have done here. Um, and he said that General Logan, though he was not feeling the best and he was very, very worn out, that the success of the day was as much attributable to him, attributed to him as to any other troop in this. So, so General Logan, he is saying he is one of the major reasons for this battle being as successful as it was. Well, I mean, you can, I think when you're fighting in the woods, now I don't, don't have as much artillery, but when you're in the woods and you can entrench that way and you got a guy who keeps hitting you in your front, um, it, that's it's it's recipe recipe for disaster i think the post battle thing we were talking about a few minutes ago was that was that wavering and shaking opinion of probably hood's leadership overall now soldiers liked hood johnston because johnston didn't get them killed recklessly right yeah, exactly. probably why they like by the same reason why they like, like sherman right mm -hmm. he he wanted to protect his troops i mean you, you look at johnston and sherman at benville they just they just stared at each other mary that's what that's what they did so you you look at overall how the commander can you know how they run their battles and of course the soldiers are going to like a guy who's not reckless how could you like a guy and all honestly who is promoted and he leads you into an offensive attack that was supposed to be defensive you run into the meat grinder four times okay yeah meanwhile you, you don't even come to the battlefield you stay back at the hotel right at the headquarters yeah, and then what? You, then what you do is you praise the guy who was leading you into the meat grinder. Yeah, how are you going to react to that? Killed. Like right. I that that would just I would be like, holy shit. Um, the one thing I want to mention is you know there's, you know it's believed that Howard is not an aggressive commander, but he has this to say in his memoirs. After the battle, he describes himself as feeling pretty ambitious, and he wanted to put fresh troops in to sweep the field and make a bold and strong effort to capture Atlanta. So he's all like, let's keep fucking going after this. But he recognizes that Logan's men are very tired as were Blair's and Dodge's. And he said, the Atlanta works were complete and strong. Therefore my cooler judgment said, let well enough alone. Uh -huh. So right there, Howard after this is like, let's keep going. And he takes a step back and he's like, you know what? No. And I think that's the sign of a really good commander right there. You know, I think he so. wants, I... that, that adrenaline wants him to keep going because they've had a success right now. They have not captured the railway, but they've managed to drive these troops away back into Atlanta once again. 
you know, but he's just like, he's thinking of that goal, like, oh my God, we could do this. We could do this. We beat them. You know, let's keep going. But he lets cooler heads prevail, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. No, it does. It does. And, and it, lead, it leads to, um, it leads to the march of the sea because of more confidence he has. And I, and I think what, what that does is it ends up in a situation where he's got a guy now he can, he can trust and he can put him in, in, in place who can do what his orders are, stick with the orders and, and play the game plan that he's supposed to play. Mm -hmm. And it was just ironic because Howard did not get the railroad. So if you look at a strategic type of battle, he did not achieve his victory, his goals. No. But at the same time, he didn't get his division erect, his core erect either, his army. Exactly. He, he was able to really help win a psychological battle. And I think for him personally, it's what he had to have. If he got flanked again at Ezra, he was done. I, don't, I mean, even you would have to not defend him anymore, Mary. You have to find a new. You have to find a new one-armed man to, to, to follow. You know, <laughs> but I think I think what it did is it did give Sherman. It's just speculating. He it did give Sherman the confidence to put him as one of his his wings on the march of the sea. Yeah. Because I think he gained his trust at Ezra, and I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Well, there was Sherman wrote to Schofield after the battle, and Sherman says something very similar in his memoirs about Howard. But this was a letter that he wrote to Schofield, and Howard actually discovered it when he was writing his memoirs in the 1900s. And Sherman said of Howard, General Howard's conduct today had an excellent effect on his command. After the firing ceased, he walked the line and the men gathered about him in the most affectionate manner, and he at once gained their hearts and their confidence. I deem this a perfect restoration to confidence in themselves and the leader of that army. So Sherman knows that he's, you know, he's saying I've, I put the right guy in place. And I think, you know, we look back at Howard with 150 years and we hear Chancellorsville and the supposed mistakes at Gettysburg, which I don't think he made mistakes at Gettysburg, but I think if we were to go back in real time, we might see a different Oliver Otis Howard and have a different opinion of him that clearly William Tecumseh Sherman respects this guy. He puts him in command for a reason, not just because he's from West Point, but, you know, I think this is Howard's probably his best day in the civil war. Well, it's definitely part of the Howard redemption tour. So that crescent moon was shining brightly. It definitely right. was on Ezra Church that day. So what's next, Mary? So next, we are going to be talking Battle of Wilson's Creek, and then we will be talking about the conspirators for the Abraham Lincoln assassination. We will be Ooh, having that, that Dave Taylor risky. join us for that discussion. He is at Lynn Conspirators on Twitter if you want to check him out, but he's going to be joining us for that discussion in a couple of weeks. Yep, a lot of fun stuff coming down the pike. So Wilson's yep. Creek next week. And then we are going to um, we are going to do the conspirators, and then we are taking well deserved week off, Mary. Yeah, we're we going to take a little. We're going to take a week off, I think, and just kind of hang out. Maybe yeah, we who are. knows? Maybe we'll change our mind. We'll, we'll figure that out. But yeah, that's we'll that's the happens. plan. That's the yeah. plan. Anyway, I thought it was a good discussion. I think it's fun. I think a lot, not a lot of people study Ezra Church, but I think it's a microcosm of a lot of what Hood did. I think it's something that the anti Howard people don't really focus on. Um, they don't talk a heck of a lot about it admittedly, but I think it's one that's an important story because really it was setting up that real strong right end of that union line. It repelled um, Hood's attack and it really, really gave a Stephen D. Lee a kick in the coin purse as far as going forward after that. No question. It absolutely did. So um, any parting words? No, I, I think it's, it's a fun discussion. I think it's a good thing. Um, this was definitely uh, definitely a fun one to to mm -hmm. kind of dust off the old brain with as we go back into Atlanta. So we talked a lot about Atlanta early on with this yep. stuff, and we kind of breezed right through this. We knew we were going to get back to it, but I think it definitely tells the story. When you're looking at the Atlanta campaign, you look at two things. You look at Kennesaw, and you look at Ezra. If you want to look at actual real, real battles, mm -hmm. and I think they're both important. And I think it was a lesson of one union guy mistakenly attacked frontally on the Confederate, and the Confederates pay back the favor on this one. And they kind of even Stevens it out, but yeah. it showed how important it was to play defensive, how it was to be, have your logistics, how important it was to have good communication, and more importantly, how important it is to put the right guys in charge and not exactly. just pick the guys you like yeah. because of because because of pol political reasons. And um, I think Sherman chose wisely, and I think Hood chose poorly. 
Absolutely. He did. And that's the, you know, that's the other thing to remember when you're looking at Ezra church is this is kind of it, it, it's going a little bit deeper into hood's command and understanding a little bit more of why the morale was so bad, you know, in some ways hood is, is a good, you know, he's, he has his talents, but I think by this point, his injuries are really, really starting to play into how he's commanding. And he is just, he is aggressive and that's what Jeff Davis wanted but he's not holding the morale of the army at all. And it's quite evident that this starts kind of falling apart at Ezra church and Ezra church is in many ways, a precursor to what we are going to see happen on November the 30th, 1864 at Franklin. All right. All right well, off we go to Wilson's Creek. We're going back further back in the early part of the war again. Trans Mississippi about, for our about, trans Mississippi fans. I know we have a few trans Mississippi again, fans. Again, they talk here. about old Wilson's <laughs> Creek and all that stuff that comes after that, that, that we talked about before that we talked about. So anyway, so um, off we go. So a great time as always looking forward to the next one. So by the time this drops, we will have our live that same morning. We got a lot of fun stuff coming up down the road. So um, Mary, as always a pleasure. It was a good time. Pleasure again, as always, as all yours. And um despite the deja vu moment at the beginning we had a good time with this and we have a lot of fun talking about the boys especially Howard in a positive frame this time as we can really talk about how things he did right yeah. not the things he did wrong so maybe there'll be a good meme not making fun of Howard this time. <laughs> we'll find out we shall see well thank you to all of our listeners for supporting us for these last 50 episodes and thank you especially to you Darren for sticking by me and um with these last Bye 50 episodes them. Oh God! Yeah, you know what? We all have our crosses <laughs> to bear, Mary. I, hey, yeah, I'm I working on working on working on sainthood, but that's okay. I know you are. Uh, it's all good. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Looking forward to the next one. So thanks for checking us out and supporting to Mary's point. These 50 episodes. Holy crap! Our one year anniversary of this podcast is coming up in just a couple of weeks. We'll have some fun with that. Anyway, off to Wilson's Creek. We go. Okay. See you guys later. Peace out. Bye.